Echo. I don't hear any echo. <laughs> okay. Kurt and Bill look very befuddled right now. We, this is yeah. this is ridiculous. Okay. All Everything right. you say, <laughs> we hear twice. Oh, great. All right. Okay. So, uh, welcome to Season 8, Episode 30 of Let's Go Blues Radio. We're broadcasting live on Wednesday, September 25th, 2019. <laughs> this is franchise episode number 216 all time. Your hosts tonight are yours truly, Kurt Price, Bill Day, and Jeff Ponder. And for your listening pleasure, we'll be with you for the next little while talking Stanley Cup champion St. Louis Blues hockey. Oh, this is rough. <laughs> to, you know what? To interact, with, to interact with us on social media, follow the show on Twitter, at LGB Radio. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Kurt Price. Bill's is at Billy Blue Note, and Jeff's is at jponder94. Also, follow us on Instagram, like us on the Facebook, and the website is letsgoblues.com, where you can listen to past episodes, browse the discussion forum, as well as get some cool T-shirts, mugs, and stickers that help support the show. And if you enjoy the show, we ask if you wouldn't mind leaving us a shiny review on iTunes, please. Um, I apologize for the uh, goofy intro, but yeah, Bill and I are hearing some bad echoes, and we basically have to take our headphones off, so <laughs> I'll, do, I'll have it halfway on. Um, we're giving away free stuff. If you have, if you're not aware, uh, our Twitter and T-shirt uh, uh, and arena seat back contest is going on right now, and the deadline to enter is the opening night puck drop on October second. So head on over to our Twitter account, which is at LGB Radio, and uh, what you have to do to enter is uh, follow the show, then like and retweet the tweet that we have pinned on our account, and uh, that talks about the contest. And the more followers we get, the more we stuff we give away. So and if uh, we get to 3,000 followers. We'll be giving away a total of three T-shirts and an old arena seat back, which is the uh, the golden nugget surprise, the gold nugget prize for this uh, contest. Um, uh, yeah, it's a piece of history. So um, be sure to do that if you uh, want to help the show out. Um, Jeff, your Hi. ongoing behind the enemy lines summer series is about to wrap up, right? Yeah, we've got two episodes left. Um, first of all, I want to say, guys, that. Uh, we have got so much content now for uh, Blooper Reel. So congratulations. This is great. We're, uh, we're going to be able to, to produce so much stuff. It's going to have ridiculous opens to the start of this season. I love it. Uh, but no, Behind Enemy Lines, going great. Um, we uh, got two, season, two episodes left, Columbus Blue Jackets and Winnipeg Jets. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting those out to everybody. Um, thank you, everybody, for listening. First of all, I want to mention here, Lachlan ruined it in the YouTube chat. Um, I'm glad he caught himself because his, his comment. Hey, Kurt and Bill, I just want to let you know that I love your show and listen to it at school and while I'm doing homework, everything. <laughs> and then he says, oh, and Jeff. <laughs> Thanks, bud. Thanks. I've only been working my ass off all summer to get a summer series out. And I'm, I'm the oh, and Jeff. You know what? I don't want you listening to our show. No. I'm kidding. Thank you for listening. Thank yeah. you for listening. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, go away. Thank you. I mean, and uh, yes, everyone that's listened to the Behind Enemy Lines series, about to wrap yeah. up. Very cool. Uh, guys, uh, Kurt and Bill, thanks to you guys for letting me just kind of run with it this summer. It's been a lot of fun, and um, I'm looking forward to getting wrapped up and getting into our live shows every single week. Yeah, and uh, I think the echo has gone away. So let's uh, cross our fingers. Oh, good. That, that has not come back. <laughs> that was the worst <laughs> Experience. Remember when I've, Tom Calhoun yeah, came on right. the show and we had that, he had the echo that's, problem? That's what I was about to oh say. My the, God. This, that was by far the worst experience yeah. we've had since Tom Calhoun <laughs> debacle. So. The lost episode. Right. For um, those that are watching the uh, the live episode here, we got, uh, we're going to talk to Adam here in a bit, but we have a guest on the show. And um, I'm sure Adam, you know, I was gonna about to make a joke like, ha, he was on an unprofessional podcast with Jason Martin of the Blues Hockey Podcast. Then he comes on ours, and it's like, oh, man, he seems like a genius compared to us. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jason's a friend of the show. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say anything negative. Technical difficulties happen, and uh, I am no good at that stuff, so... My only help would be laughing at you guys so you could hear the echo. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, as Jeff mentioned, we do have uh, Adam uh, on the show, uh, Adam Scorgi. Uh, he has uh, produced a number of documentary films, uh, maybe more notably to our audience for producing Ice Guardians, which was fantastic. 
and most recently the uh, the making of Coco, the Grand Freer story, which is coming to St. Louis next week on October 1st, so in a, in a special screening at Ballpark Village, and will then be shown at a number of Marcus theaters in St. Louis, uh, in St. Louis area for a limited time beginning on October 4th. Uh, Jeff, Bill, and I have our tickets for making Coco, so we're going to kick back into some comfy dream lounger uh, seats at Ronnie's Theater on Friday the 4th, uh, so we're all looking forward to that. Uh, Adam, welcome to the show, and again, we apologize for the uh, technical stuff going on. Ah, don't worry about it. Thanks for having me on. And I'm glad you got all those details so good because I literally was like doing homework and be like, man, I got to remember like what theaters and anything. So there you go. Your audience knows where it's playing. Perfect. <laughs> I've, I've, to... had my, I've had my sales agent and my team kind of handle this one so I can just come out and enjoy it and hang out with Grant because we've, we've built a great relationship with Grant. And like I said earlier, before it went live, like I'm good friends with Chaser and several of the blues. So I've been just kind of been like, oh, I can't wait to just come to St. Louis and enjoy it. So thank you for the great intro. I think I think we can um, ask you the question we're all wondering. You say you're friends with blues players and former blues players. How good of friends are you with Eric Brewer? I, that is one I don't know, but I I, I followed his career because as a diehard Oilers fan, we had a hate love relationship with Brewer, right? Because he could be <laughs> so spectacular at moments, and then other moments he'd be really frustrating. Um, but now having a kid that's in hockey, I see that that is just part of the game. It is a, yes. it's a very difficult game. It moves really fast. Uh, and God, I, I am so, I, I, it, it's been a nice learning experience going through my daughter and seeing where, you know, every parent I think at first is kind of like, hey, like you need to do this and you need to do that. So easy when you're up in the stands and you're not on ice, like on what you should do. I like, I'm, I'm a pro. I joke with the parents. I'm like, give me a controller and I can win every game. No problem. But uh, <laughs> it's a very, very different thing when you're actually on the ice and playing. But uh, that's a long answer to your question. I, I never have actually even met Eric Brewer. That's one I have not met. You, uh, you uh, grew up in British Columbia, correct? Cor well, born in British I'm, Columbia? Yeah, I was born in Trail, BC, and I grew up in Canada, but I've also lived overseas. I lived in uh, Singapore and Australia and stuff when I was a kid, too. And then I went to film school in New York and uh, lived in Houston, Texas for a bit, too. So I'm a seasoned traveler. Um, so I, when I first saw that you were born in British Columbia, I figured, oh, Canucks fan, but no, you're a diehard Oilers, Oilers fan. Diehard Oilers fan. And, and growing up in BC, uh, when the Oilers have not been good for the last decade has been painful. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, it's at all those jokes of like how many Oilers fans take to screw in a light bulb. Uh, none because they're all talking about the eighties and stuff like that. Like I had constant jokes like that for the last decade until Oh six, we had a little bit of love there. And then uh, back to, you know, some excitement with McDavid. But now it, we're hoping this, this year brings us out of the light, but it's been some dark days being an Oilers fan. Uh, for those that uh, may not know exactly what a movie producer does, maybe fill them in on, uh, on what the responsibilities are for uh, the, the films that you've worked on. Sure. So the, the ones I've worked on, kind of what my specialty has become is uh, the financing. Really, the, the, when you get the producer credit, you're the one that puts, you're the glue. You're the one that produces and gets it done. So uh, typically for me with these docs, I'm the one that will go get it uh, pre-sold to networks and broadcasters and then get it into production. Um, but then I'm also, like most docs, most people do several roles. So I'm also... Uh, you know, heavily in the marketing side, which is why I do interviews <laughs> and everything else. It's not, uh, and social media and stuff like that. Although I'm starting to bring people on to help because I just can't manage. I have like, I don't know, between Twitter and Instagram, I have like 25 accounts. It's getting to be too many, too many. Um, but, uh, that's typically what a producer does is the producer is the one we always joke and say that we're, we're professional firemen because we just put out fires all the time. So that's, that's what we do is we get it financed and we put out fires as they come. Uh, so uh, the idea for making Coco, um, how did that come about? I mean, obviously you're an Oilers fan, so that's probably a, a general interest for you anyway. But yeah. uh, what got that ball rolling with uh, the, the story? Uh, it, was, it was actually our director, Don Metz. I'd worked with him at Aquila, which did the, the show Oil Change. Like before you did like the blues TV series, like Oil Change was like the first one. Um, and Don had approached me and said, look, I really want to do the show on Grand Fuhrer. Um, you know, would you love to, would you be interested? Do you think you could take it to market and get it financed? 
And I specialize in like tax credits and, and stuff in Canada using provincial and federal tax credits along with pre-selling the films. So I was like, I'd love to do something on Grant. Being an Oilers fan, I, I couldn't wait to go um, and try to get it sold. So took it out to market and got it sold pretty quickly. And then uh, like, I'm just thankful Don brought it to me. It was, it was a great opportunity. And then especially once you meet Grant, we got him on the phone and I had kind of my geek out moment where we had him on speakerphone and we we're inch- meeting each other digitally for the first time or over the phone and, and Grant goes, hey Adam, I just gotta tell you, like I watched Ice Guardians and I loved it. I thought it was a fantastic movie and like I'm so happy that you're doing mine. And, like we like, I had to put it on mute because I was like, man, Grant Shearer, who I grew up like idolizing, thinks it's cool that I'm doing his film. So uh, it was pretty cool. And then from there, it was uh, a delight to work on this one. Uh, Grant uh, Fior has a very interesting story to tell. Probably quite uh, uh, emotional at times. A lot of interesting things have happened to him uh, over the course of his life and his career. Uh, was it was it difficult for him to be as open and honest as possible for the film? Because I know, I guess I imagine as a producer, you'd like to see as much authenticity and honesty and detail for uh, as possible for uh, a good documentary. You're bang on, and that was something we were concerned about. Um, not that like Grant isn't open, but just that. He's not a man of many words at times, right? In his interview days when he played, he was very to the point. So, uh, but Don Metz, the director, had known him for close to 25 years. So we knew that there was a good personal connection there. And Grant is so comfortable in who he is now that he, when we first met, he said, look, I'm not scared. I'll go into the suspension. I'll go into all that stuff because the peaks and valleys are what make a great doc. If we just was... It was all great, like he's amazing, he's amazing, he's amazing, he's amazing. That doesn't help. So, you know, when he came right out of the gate and said, oh, we don't have to ignore the elephant in the room. I'll talk all about the suspension, how that went down, how that affected my family and my career. Then I knew we had something that was really special. Uh, St. Louis fans uh, should have some pretty positive memories of Grant Fuhrer. He, he played very well in his four seasons here, putting up career best uh, save percentage and GAA numbers for the Blues. Uh, Mike Keenan played him in a ridiculous 79 games in the 95-96 season. Uh, and, of course, had the memorable incident with Nick Kiprios in the 96 playoffs uh, that end of your season, uh, which is something Blues fans still love to hate Kiprios for. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, would, I mean, I, I assume uh, the Kiprios incident uh, was discussed in the, in the film? Oh, man, the Blues fans are going to love it. Because not only is it discussed, Nick Kiprios interviewed for the film and talked about the incident. Oh, yeah. That, oh God, no. yeah. So yeah. he lied again? <laughs> I was going to uh, say, because he, he's on, he's on, he has said, and not too long ago, that he didn't dive into, into Fear. So I'll be curious to see what's said in the film. Uh, what well, do you guys want spoilers or do you guys want to wait? I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's wait. Uh, Make everybody yeah, wait. Right. All right, all right. <laughs> It, it's really good. And hey, and, and it shows you how outstanding of a person Grant is that Grant, uh, Kiprios almost cried that day. He was really emotional because he said that just shows you the type of human being that Grant is, is that he was willing to have me interviewed for his film. Um, uh, you know, with all the great people that volunteered and stepped up to be interviewed, that he would want me a part of this and to be able to tell that story is remarkable. He got pretty emotional that he was really you know, and he said, this part didn't make the film, but he talked about how he's like, I never cheered for a team I didn't play on more than I cheered for the Blues after we injured, after I accidentally injured Grant because he's like, I felt horrible and I think they had a chance to win the cup that year had he not been injured. So it was the first time I ever rooted for a team that I wasn't playing for. You so, know, Adam, it, don't make me feel respect for Nick. <laughs> that, that goes you against might, everything that I've done for the last 20 yeah. years. You might, you might end up liking him after you watch the doc. You just might. And then Pronger talks about that incident too, right? Because he was the one that cross-checked him, and we had Pronger in there. Pronger was hilarious. He was awesome. He's, he's great in, in the film. So that was one of the things that was so great about the film that was so easy is Grant is so loved. And, I, and I'm not just saying that, like, oh, like, oh he's so loved. Like, there's, there's some athletes that are not loved by everybody, but Grant is to the point where everybody we asked, like, before we even finished the sentence, they're like, oh, for Fierzy, for Coco, no problem. I'm in. Like, you know, who's producing it? Like, oh, Don Metz is directing and the producer from Ice Garden is producing it. Like, we, we had a lineup. We could have interviewed another 100 players if we wanted to, but we, we tried to stay, stay away from, from too many. Otherwise, we'd have to make it into the Making Coco series, not the movie. <laughs> I think I know, uh, I, you know, I honestly think I know Kiprios' 
mindset, what it, what he was going through his mind, when, uh, the whole incident uh, with uh, mm. Pronger and Fuhr, and Fuhrer in his knee. Uh, when, when I played, I think it's just a situation where he obviously, I'm, I'm, and I'm going to guess what he's going to maybe say in the, in the film, that, that mm. he didn't want to obviously injure Fuhrer like that. It's gamesmanship in a sense where he's trying to rattle a goalie. He's diving into a goalie. He's, he's taking advantage of a situation where he could hit Fjord and and he did and as a and when I used to play I I did the same damn thing one time with a stick I came across the goalie's head with a stick when I got cross checked into the goalie and I I did it on purpose <laughs> I didn't want to hurt him I just wanted to you know I I, just said that, I, you, I get it you, I guess you wanted you wanted to rattle a hot goaltender and, and Grant was on a mission that year he was unbelievable. And not only did he play 79 games that year, 78, he played 73 the following year after that serious injury. Like, yep. tremendous, tremendous. That's something that, you know, because Grant's a quiet man and not kind of that uh, typical aggressive, you know, male that you that you tend like a superstar athlete with him might be, you know, people forget how tough he was. Like, you hear all the other players talk about, like, man, after Keenan would play him night after night and he'd be, like, he'd, he'd literally be in a tub of ice trying to recover to be able to play the next game. But you couldn't pull Grant out of there. Uh, uh, Grant seems like a pretty go with the flow kind of guy. Uh, without and you mentioned earlier about a man of uh, fairly few words. Uh, without giving too much of the film away, does he? Does he? Does Grant have any animosity towards uh, uh, Kiprios, or is he more of the mindset? No, that's hockey. No, we we without giving too many spoilers. It's it's a good moment I think for people that hate Kiprios and and I mean look. Even somebody that Grant doesn't get along with is his original agent, Rich Winter, and he wanted to have him in the film. Uh, and Rich even said, too, that he said after the interview, he's like, man, this is very therapeutic for me. I'm so thankful that Grant, you know, reached out and wanted me to be part of the film. Um, so it, it, Grant definitely is not the guy. The, the only person I've heard him hold a little bit of animosity to is his former agent. But everybody right. else, he forgives Nick. They're friends now. He forgives, you know doesn't look back in the hockey career. He called it a hockey play and said, look, in the playoffs back then, you fell on goalies. That's what you did. You tried to get into their skin, especially a hot goalie. If your team just felt they couldn't get anything by him, that's what you try to do. So um, without getting, I'll let you guys see the rest though, but it's, it's, it's a great moment in the film for sure. And there's some humor in there too with Pronger and everybody else, but it's, it's good. And it's probably one of those things that you have to look back on and I guess laugh and joke about. I mean, otherwise you just kind of drive yourself nuts. Um, uh, how how long did this the, the take to put this together from start to finish? I mean, was it a? a what, would you say it? It was actually pretty quick as far as docs go. We had it like all done and edited within a year, and that's fast. Normally we have about an eighteen month schedule, but our one editor on this one, Pollyanna, she's lightning fast, and then. Uh, uh, just because of the schedule with Grant and everything happening, like where, because he travels all over, it, it ended up, we got the interviews and stuff really quickly. So yeah, it was all done within a year and we had it ready. We premiered during the Toronto International Film Festival last year. Uh, this is your second hockey documentary. Uh, uh, Technically I, my third. third. I actually, I was, I was also an executive producer on the Probert doc that came out recently, uh, but not my baby. I didn't, I didn't bring that from start to finish. I just, I was more of just a consultant on that one, helped okay. out a little bit. So, is this like a a, a, a thing for you now? Are you gonna like uh, do another hockey film? Uh, if so, uh, if you want, if you're gonna do I'd another love one, to. what what yeah. uh, what would you like to do? Because I, I have a suggestion. So, <laughs> so so bear with me now, and I know yeah. this may seem like fiction. Yep. But how about maybe a 2019 St. Louis Blues worst of first on the back of a fifth string goalie cup championship uh, story? Uh, it, it, man, second, you know, I, <laughs> I was, I was, I was cheering for the Blues big time in this. Obviously, with my friendship with Chaser and and Grant having played there, and the Blues I've gotten to meet, and what the Blues accomplished. Like I was bringing up all those things, right? That like at the halfway point, you guys were the worst in the league, right? The Blues were the worst, and then. They bring in a, a tough guy, an ice guardian, to be the coach who everybody ridiculed at first, except for maybe some local blues people who thought they're like, I actually, I actually chirped at a few of the, the writers that are so against guys. I'm like, oh, are, are goons like this still useless to the league, or is there some value now that he won a Stanley Cup and being the first guy ever to take a team from last place to win? And like you said, on like a backup goalie that was about to quit last year and everything, and 
all these guys were like, I never said that. And I was like, here's your article from this date. Here's your article <laughs> yeah. from this date. Like, <laughs> like, I'm like, you guys are such hypocrites. You guys are flip flop. Um, but yeah, I mean, a tremendous story. And I was cheering for the blues and I don't know how he can't be a big rig fan, right? Like the big goal he scored again, like I, I have a soft spot always for the tough guys that are still finding their way to be valuable in the league. So I was cheering for the blues and that is a great story, but, um, I'm pretty sure the NHL is already locked on that one. That uh, <laughs> at Mr. Adam scored, you will not be getting the rights to do that one. <laughs> so, uh, how about yeah? What what Kurt originally said? Is there one that you kind of have in mind that you'd like to do next? There's one right now that got brought to me that I'm pretty interested in called Rocket and Renegade, and it's all about the unique friendship that Pavel Bure and, and um, Gino Ocek built while being in Vancouver. You know, coming from two totally different walks of life, Gino Ocek that grew up on a uh, an indigenous reserve out in Quebec, uh, you know, with, with French Canadian being his first language and starting hockey very late and nobody ever thinking he'd have a chance now in playing in the NHL. And then you have, you know, Pavel Burry come from the Russian angle. His dad was a five time like Olympian, uh, you know, basically groomed him and his brother Valeri from birth to be these superstar hockey players. And when, when Burry came over, he really didn't connect with anybody on the team. And, and Gino didn't connect with anybody either. Cause he was actually hanging out with like, the people, the homeless people in uh, East Hastings for a while because he didn't connect and the two of them have become best of friends to the point where Gino named his son uh, Burre Ocek and actually helped get Burre's names retired in the rafters with the Aquilini family. Um, and then, you know, we're on borrowed time with Gino already because he has a rare heart condition that's on an experimental drug right now to keep him alive. Uh, and Gino's worked with me on Ice Guardians and stuff. So that's one that right now we're trying to get, uh, I'm trying to put the financing together for, but incredible story. And when you've seen the recent success of like the Russian Five and Red Army, you know, the Russian angle of Pavel is very interesting as well. So uh, that's one that came about and we're, I'm developing that with a producer named Gary Waxman who used to work for the NHL. So we're hoping we can get that into production here in the next year or so. Uh, there will be a special screening of uh, Making Coco, the Grant Fear story in St. Louis on October 1st at Ballpark Village. Uh, tickets are available at uh, the website, ballparkvillage.com. And then it will be released at uh, Select St. Louis Theaters that Friday, October 4th. Um, and you can check out the Marcus Theaters website uh, for tickets for that. Um, so, yeah, get your tickets and check this film out. Um, if it's half as good as our Ice Guardians, uh, it's going to be fantastic. Well, um, thank you, and I and I promise it is. It's it's. Uh, <laughs> you it's, promise it's it, half it, as good as Ice Guardians. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never want to say you never want to say it's better. That's a lose lose battle for me, right? Because Chaser's my producing partner on there, so I'm like, oh, Chaser, I think it's better. He's gonna do <laughs> really. You do? Uh, it, no, it is a it, it, it's a fantastic film, and it really does. Um, I, you see Grant in a way you've never seen him before, unless you're really good friends with Grant. This you see him very emotional in this film. The film pulls on your heartstrings just like Ice Guardians does as well, but also really kind of reminds you of all the firsts and the groundbreaking stuff that the flair and the charisma on the ice that Grant Fuhr brought, you know, and kind of reminds you. And for blues fans, there's a great section about the blues and you forget how good he was when he came here and how close he was to not coming. Like people thought, because you guys traded away Cujo. Everybody thought you guys, like he was a has-been cup goalie that was going to come to town and shit the bed. And the guy stood on his head, right? Like he absolutely crushed it. And that was because of a conversation. I'm giving a spoiler here. Mike Keenan was in New York and a big suburban stopped by and jumped out Wayne and Janet Gretzky. And they were talking about the team. And Keenan's like, who do you think the goalie should be? And, and Wayne goes, Grant, here's your goalie. And he's like, we were actually just talking about that. And he's like, he's, Wayne believes he's the greatest that ever played. Um, if he'd had the defense that other teams have, he'd have a lower goals against average. And he said, and they said, yep, that was the final thing we did. And then, but then Grant showed up to training camp overweight and they send him home. <laughs> so he had to get back into shape. Uh, Adam, uh, where can listeners find you uh, online and find info about the film and any future projects you might have? Uh, well, me, I'm just Adam score like a goal with the G. So as you'd caught with my name, so Adam score G. I'm on Instagram is just score G uh, for the film. It's making Coco. If you Google making Coco, you'll find it's making Coco, Twitter, making Coco, Instagram, making Coco, Facebook page. And, um, you know, really hope you guys that, that the local uh, St. Louis residents go to the theaters because it's really hard to get a documentary into theaters, especially a sports one, especially a hockey documentary. But, you know, with the blues, you know, magical run last year and hockey being more popular than ever. 
Uh, we negotiated the deal with the theaters, so I really hope people go to the theaters and check it out. But if you can't make it to the theaters, on October 12th, it'll be available pretty much worldwide on platforms like iTunes and, and Amazon and Google Play. Okay, and uh, uh, one more quick. I just wanted to ask one more quick question. Um, sure. You you mentioned uh, that you know you're kind of a producer and that's what you do. You make documentaries outside of hockey. For anyone who might be interested listening to the show, uh, what uh, what other kind of passions do you have that you make documentaries about? Uh, well, we just wrapped production on Bisbing, the Michael Bisbing story. So we're doing his documentary. If anybody out there is MMA fans. Uh, Remarkable human being there too, like the real life Rocky story, but crazier. Uh, and become very good friends with Michael. That'll be releasing early in the U new year. And we're currently doing the film festival run of um, Inmate Number One: The Rise of Danny Trejo. So, and for those that might not know who Danny Trejo is, he's the big bad Chicano in pretty much every movie, <laughs> TV show you've ever watched. He's been in almost 400 uh, movies on IMDb from Breaking Bad to Sons of Anarchy to Heat to Blood In, Blood Out. Um, if you don't know Danny Trejo's name off by heart, you will certainly recognize him when you see his face. Uh, so I those are some love, of the other ones. love, love, love Danny Trejo. I, I know oh. it sounds weird, but man, I, everything he's done, Machete, yeah. I think he is great. Machete. Yeah, yeah, well, he's, he, yeah he's, uh, well, the documentary is, uh, I think director Brett Harvey, it's the same director who did Ice Garden, did a spectacular job. We just did our world premiere at the Calgary Film Festival. Uh, it is... I, it's always great for me as a filmmaker when you watch a film for the first time with an audience because it's a different experience, right? Because people react to things and people absolutely are. I didn't realize how funny the inmate one was, but Danny is hilarious. He has people throughout the entire film like howling. So it is, but it's got the sensitive parts where we've seen people crying. It's got it's got it all. It's a special film, and we're really really close to announcing a very very big release on that one. So. Uh, stay tuned at, right. at, tra at Treo Doc, and you can find it, T-E-R-J-O Doc, and you can find it on all the social media platforms. I'm going to have to follow that because, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. When he was in the last Muppets movie, he appeared, just, you know, <laughs> one of their cameos. Yeah. I like, I was a kid. As yeah. Trejo, as Danny yeah, Trejo in yeah, prison, yeah, yeah. in a gulag yeah. in Russia. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I was in the theater, and I remember I even threw my arm up, and I go, Danny Trejo, like yeah. I was a little kid. <laughs> My yeah. wife was like, "Who is that?" I'm like, "He's yeah. awesome. That's who he is." Yeah. <laughs> well, if you were if you were young when you watched that, you must have like grown up watching like Spy Kids and stuff, right? Because that was the first time you oh. put into kids movies. Yeah, when he was oh, Uncle yeah, Machete, yep. he was Uncle Machete, right? That was the, <laughs> yep. just the position of what he looks was. He was Uncle Machete. Yep. There was we talk all about that in the film. That's all in the doc of how that happened. And Robert Rodriguez put that together, and yeah. Uh, before you go, there was a conversation on Twitter uh, oh, two, three weeks ago. Uh, uh, someone was asking if uh, Making Coco was going to be released on DVD. Yes, it will be on DVD through Amazon. It's hard to get physical deals now, but <laughs> we experienced this with Ice Guardians and everything, is that hockey films seem to have, because hockey, hockey fans are collectors, right? So for there seems to be a market that isn't normally there because people want to get the DVD and if they bump into Grant, they want to get it signed, right? Or their favorite blues or their favorite guy. So we actually got, believe it or not, a Walmart deal here in Canada for physical, which is next to impossible nowadays. And it will be available on Amazon around the same time. I think the physical comes out in the first week of November though. It's a okay. little, it's a little lag from the, the VOD. I do believe somebody else uh, in that same thread asked about VHS. <laughs> I, I, I'm not. I'm not kidding. VHS, How about Betamax? Is it coming out I, in Betamax? Hey, I, I'm impressed that you know about Betamax. That is. Uh, uh, I was going to say you're almost dating to where like technologies that uh, youth are not even familiar with anymore. Uh, I yeah, have right. no idea how to get a Betamax made unless somebody takes a DVD <laughs> or a VHS and has the machines at their house and can cross it over. I have no idea. There certainly isn't wow. any companies. Like, I, I don't even know where you'd get, like, the tapes for VHS. Like, I, I doubt there's even one in the U.S. where they actually, like, still make VHS. I'd be shocked if there was. Can I, can I play the audio on my phonograph? <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you're, if you're as tech-savvy as the beginning of this podcast, I don't know if you guys will be able to play uh, the DVD, oh, so we'll see. That's, uh, that, <laughs> uh, Brock, we had that coming. Yeah. Yeah. We had that coming. That's fantastic. Totally but, but, but for DVDs, you kind of put them in a DVD player and you hit play. There's kind of a menu and you guys can, yeah, that works too. 
Very cool. <laughs> Adam, you have you have earned yourself another guest appearance on the show with that. <laughs> yes. Comment. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. I had to throw in a little humor at the end there. No. What is uh, Mr. Blue's hat in the YouTube chat says this guy learns fast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Adam, uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight on Let's Go Blues Radio. We really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on, gentlemen. Uh, next week, guys, uh, making cocoa in St. Louis, October first, and then uh, Friday the fourth in theaters. Yes, come see the, the, the main LGBT of- crew at uh, Ronnie's. Yeah, we'll be at Ronnie's. Yeah, 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 we'll be at Ronnie's on that Friday. Is the is the one in? Uh, is they doing it in Peabody or whatever it's called now? Is that sold out already? <clears throat> the the one at Ballpark Village. The, it's Ballpark ball- Village. That's it's, what it is. Yes, it's, yeah, yeah. Ballpark Village. It's getting there. We a lot of tickets are starting to happen the last couple of days. Most people buy two weeks before, right? So, uh, and Grand Fear is going to be doing a Q and A there, hosted by Panger and a few right. other blues alumni. So it's going to be a cool night. And uh, you know, with Panger, he's one of the best moderators in the game. So it'll be uh, it'll be a fun night. I'm looking forward to. I love when I get to sit on stage with them and I get the one generic question for the producer. So what inspired you to do this? <laughs> oh, uh, and we lost Adam. We lost Adam. Well, uh, thanks for coming on, Adam. Yeah, thanks, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, I mean, he totally set it up. So now you, somebody's got to ask him that question, right? <laughs> You're right. So we, we don't know. One of our listeners has to buy a ticket and go and ask that question. Oh, uh, yeah, Adam, and Adam is. So another, uh, so again, you, you heard him say that if you are interested in that premiere event, there's a Q&A with Grant Fior. Uh, I recommend you go. I mean, I. I wanted to go, but I'm busy that night. Luckily, the three of us are, like you guys said, going to Ronnie's. But, uh, but yeah, that seems like a really fun event. So if you haven't gotten a ticket yet, you might want to do that soon. Yep. I am so looking forward to it. That's going to be fun. Yep. And I guess, uh, yeah, I guess he's, uh, I hope there wasn't like an earthquake or something where he just kind of lost power. Yeah. <laughs> earthquake <laughs> those, of all those things. Those Canadian earthquakes, know. you know. <laughs> <laughs> don't you know. The Canadian quakes, don't you know. That's a Minnesota quake. Minnesota. That is Minnesota. <laughs> I'm sorry. Damn. I'm rusty. We haven't done a live show in a while. It, Kurt, no, edit that out. No, we haven't. <laughs> there we go. Work on your accents, eh? Oh, hey, you know what the problem was at the start of the show? I had a minimized window, and the YouTube video started. That's what. That's <sighs> what I was going God. with. That. Was it? Yeah. I. 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 I, Kurt. I, had, I that was completely my fault, and I. That was just. That's a rookie mistake. That is. That was is, awful. All of a sudden, I saw him like, "Oh, you've got to be kidding me!" <laughs> that first, is. That is. That's pretty rookie, buddy. First five, that's eight minutes of the show, whatever it was. And and uh, I guess you guys couldn't hear the uh, intro music. Adam says he can still hear us. Oh, by the can. way. Oh. Huh. Yeah. Hey, Adam. <laughs> Any, anything else you want us to close on with you? Just go ahead and type it in there. Yeah. I think that's uh, interesting. I don't know what happened. We lost you somehow, buddy. Yeah. I think maybe, yeah, I think maybe uh, he can't hear us now, though. Yeah, Adam left. Okay. Okay, Adam left. Okay, <laughs> bye, Adam. <laughs> bye, Adam. <laughs> yeah, so, so something that uh, for those of you watching right now, you can probably tell there's a little bit of a different setup here. We mentioned it in our last live show that. Uh, yeah, things have changed a little bit, so we're still working on the kinks. So we apologize for all the weird <laughs> errors that uh, you might have witnessed at the start of the show. We're, we're trying to add as many kinks to the show as possible. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> get get on as many, you know, genres as, as we can. Get the word out yep. with the show. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, news. Let's talk about some blues. Um, Let's talk about uh, beers of the show. How about that? Oh, yeah. I almost forgot to go back to that. Good call. Mm-hmm. Mm, okay. Uh, Bill, beers. go ahead. Bill, what, you, what, what, what did you drink? <laughs> I'm just going to take over hosting duties. So, <laughs> Bill, go so ahead. <laughs> I've, I've got a little, just a wee bit of this uh, pint of a uh, authentic German Marzen uh, smoke beer. I'm not going to lie. It's kind of like drinking a campfire. It's <laughs> it's very heavy smoky. Uh, it's good. Uh, you know, it's Oktoberfest season, so I thought i'd try this i won so we had a trivia night at work last week and did you win raffle tickets you won raffle tickets well i didn't win raffle tickets but with a raffle ticket Ah. i won a shitload of beer like like twice as much as what our friends at teal town oh my uh and it's all international it was like an international themed trivia so all international beers except bourbon county 
There was a Bourbon County thrown in there. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. So, huh. how many I, tickets? It was like I, a ticket I, yeah, in the box. Yeah, but... six. I I bought six for five. Oh, wow. And the girl who sold it to me, like, kind of, kind of interesting story. This would be on mildly interesting on Reddit. <laughs> so she misunderstood me, and so she tore off one ticket and handed it to me. I'm like, no, 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 I wanted six for five. So the one ticket she tore off, of course, I lost, and. That was the ticket that won. I found it oh, right before the drawing. Nice. Stuck behind my driver's license in my wallet. Uh, like and it, you it, put it in the box, and yeah. then it was on top, and someone just... No. Oh, no. Okay. Not quite, but good story. <laughs> Bob Rakowski says preseason form. Yes. Definitely. Yes. That is, that is 100%. There's it's, your tweet of the... up Or your your post of the episode. It would yeah. have been a fine intro, except I had that stupid... It was the minimized window, and there was like a, what, a 15-second delay yep. or something from when we broadcast when it actually goes out on YouTube. And we were hearing ourselves 15 seconds later, and it was almost impossible to yeah. concentrate. I, could, I, oh I, was, I was about to go insane. Like, I was, <laughs> I was about to just walk out. I was like, I can't do this whole show this way. Yeah. Like, Thank God I figured out what it was. And I, Oh, uh, that's my fault. so funny. My fault. Uh, we just got another message from Adam saying I can still hear you, so I imagine he's still there. Uh, I got the one message. Oh, hmm. well, I have it twice. Yeah. So never mind. Okay. Bye, Adam. <laughs> Preseason form, everybody. <laughs> yeah. uh, what's, what are you drinking, Jeff? Uh, well, uh, for everyone who makes uh, fun of us for being beer snobs, you can't do that tonight because I am going with the Bud Light Gloria beer for the 2019 Stanley Cup champions. I uh, have a, uh, uh, what, six pack or eight pack, whatever it came in. I think it came in eight pack. Uh, still. <laughs> eight pack, yeah. I still got an eight pack still. And uh, I'm going to try to finish them up before the season starts, uh, except for the one I'm going to save, obviously. But uh, You're going to drink yeah, eight I beers mean, this, before the season starts? Eight beers? I know. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Eight, eight beers, beers, you beers. say. Woo. Um, That's crazy. But talk. yeah, I mean, this uh, this tastes like uh, Bud Light. <laughs> it's because it does, <laughs> except there was Gloria playing while it was yes. brewing. Right. Yeah. And, and that that... Where they bottled that stuff burned down today. Oh, did it? Yeah. Really? Well, it, there was a really? fire. I don't know if it burned down, but okay. the bottling plant in Arnold caught fire today. Huh. Huh. Interesting. Uh, uh, Jeff, I went your route, uh, and I my beer is dedicated to Mr. Blue's Hat. <laughs> nice. I'm sure nice. It, I'm sure he knows what it is. It's a Bud Light Orange. <laughs> so there you go. <clears throat> Nothing special today. Just a, uh, just a Bud Light orange. From a plant that burned down today. No, yeah, probably not. <laughs> They've got to brew that in Florida, right? Oh, I, oh, sure, yeah. You you can't get oranges here, right? <laughs> oh, let's see. What do we got um, today in blues history? Curtis of the at STL Blues History Twitter account, September twenty fifth, two thousand nineteen. My mom's birthday. Happy birthday, mom. Happy birthday, Marla. Uh, Happy birthday, lover. Cake. <laughs> uh, <laughs> his. Uh, Sorry. You know, uh, the uh, uh, STL Blues History's uh, Twitter account, he has a pinned tweet. He's had it for quite some time now. Have you seen this? Uh, he's requesting that Mark Hunt, in the tweet, requesting that Mark Hunter be the next Blues GM. And it's been there for a while. So I, I wonder if he still feels that way after the past couple offseason uh off seasons by Armstrong. Are you calling out STL Blues history? I'm asking a question. I'm not calling out I think anybody. You're calling I'm calling them out. Just asking a question. It's, it seems it seems like it's been there for a long time, and I wonder if he even knows it's still there. Anyhow, uh, today's date in history: Blues history, 1976. Bernie Federico played his first NHL game, preseason game, and scored a goal in the St. Louis Blues four to one win versus the Atlanta Flames. That's right, kids. The Calgary team was in Atlanta before Calgary. Your Atlanta Flames. Your Atlanta Flames. You can't touch a front yeah, flame that's... when it's red hot. You know and that, for right? those that don't know, uh, the A that you see, the flaming A for the alternate captains in Calgary, that is an homage to the Atlanta Flames. Um, did, did Have you guys seen the video on YouTube, you can't touch a flame when it's red hot? 
sung by the Calgary Flames. Right, from 86. It is the... Oh, like, yeah. During the... During their cup run. Right, during their cup run. And that was the same... Well, the Super Bowl shuffle was the, the big thing right before that. And so, so they're they, playing off that. It is the worst... <laughs> <laughs> worst Brett Hall's in it fantastic it, it is Brett Hall's yeah, in it for a it few is seconds fan it, it, it's fantastic it is not it's not one of those things that I would consider so bad it's good it's really bad <laughs> it's uh, it's, it's so cringe worthy it's, it's so bad it's just bad oh it's yeah. it's fantastic we we liked it, it. they are our, our show's account our YouTube channel liked it so it's on there if you or just search for it on uh, yeah Calgary Flames you can't touch a flame when it's red hot it's you'll yeah you'll cringe it's <laughs> It's, it's you'll cringe, then you'll turn it off. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's a uh, boom goes the dynamite, cringe worthy kind of like we just watch it, just painful to watch. So, yeah, uh, we got some blues news uh, this week. Um, some, I don't know, some some minor news. Would you say or some? What would you say that uh, eh, the blues you know, made a move of some yeah. kind? It's it's trade. Yeah, you know, it's just the trade blotter. That's all it is. Right? The question is which which Falk is it? There's two Justin Falks in the league. Yeah. So which one is it? <laughs> I'll admit, when I first saw the the email come through, Blues acquired Justin Falk, my first thought was, Oh yeah, it's the one that nobody cares about. <laughs> <laughs> like there's no way they got the good one. Uh, <laughs> this is so the Blues trade Joel Edmondson. Uh, and German prospect uh, who's playing in the Swedish Hockey League right now, Dominic Bach, and a seventh-round pick in 2021 to the Carolina Hurricanes for Justin Falk and a fifth-round pick in 2020. Um, yeah, I was. Uh, I think I was uh, of the opinion of most people that when I saw this, I was like, wow. I did not of, see that coming. Didn't right. see it coming. Uh, he was on the trade block. Uh, but I didn't think we were even interested in making any moves, really. And I'll be damned if we didn't uh, get a power play specialist that uh, makes our... I mean, we we already had a good amount of offense coming from our D. Mm-hmm. And we, we can... Damn it, guys. We can score 60 goals from the back end next year. Yeah. I mean, if 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 we got four guys that can score 15 goals... Yeah. Now now let's. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Bill. I was just going to say, as I had time to think about it and process this today, what I kept going to was that I think San Jose, when when they had brought in Carlson and they had Carlson and Burns and Vlasic, I mean, they're they everybody said you know nobody is even close to the back end that San Jose has. And Doug Armstrong just blew that out of the water. I mean, it, yeah, we have I mean, we have three all star caliber right hand shooting defensemen, and we finally got the answer to the power play. Alex Petrangelo can have a seat, <laughs> and it, yes. Justin Falk can come in and take over. And you know, I I have to think that the uh, the emphasis. Bring, you know, bringing in Mark Savard to be the power play coach. I, I uh, think that has to be a, a very big factor I was, in this move. I was thinking about that a little bit um, because we, we're bringing Savard and then not too far down the road, we get we get Falk. Um, so the power play is at the very least they're they're trying to address. The, and actually during the season, we were 10th. So it wasn't bad during right. the season. Uh, but the playoffs, they, it was they, awful. the wheels seemed to come off in the playoffs. Yeah, it was yeah. terrible. Yeah. I mean, that was it was. And, I mean, and for the Blues to have won in spite of their power play was was pretty fantastic. Yeah, I mean, they they played great, so good five on five. Um, um but, it, it that's and that's just like you guys said. I mean, you think about a team that won the Stanley Cup and um, the fact that you know get you look at the roster and how there was almost no turnover. We saw you know Pat Maroon move on and. Jordan Nolan was waived and all that stuff, but like there was almost no turnover. And so you say, okay, this team's coming back. They're going to go for another room with the same guys. But you think about it, man, and, and again, you look at eight, nine, ten months ago where we were at with Doug Armstrong, we're sitting here saying, holy shit, this guy is making improvements to a Stanley Cup winning roster. I mean, he, he looked and said the power play needed help. I mean, if the power play would have just been – 
three to four more goals more in the playoffs, you know, maybe you're not even talking about having a game seven against Boston. You know, maybe you're talking about them winning it in five or six. And, you know, maybe the Dallas series doesn't go as long. I mean, there's a lot of what ifs, but they improved the power play and and didn't really take away anything. I mean, I know that, that a lot of people have said that the loss of Pat Maroon, we're going to feel it more than we realize. But I think we've talked about it on this show a million times. Sammy Blaze ready to step in. You got Jordan Cairo, uh, Clem Costin's mm-hmm. having a great preseason. So in terms of, of step backs, I don't think they really have made any. Now, granted, the summer's not over. We still got a week till the season starts. But you look at they they they're not making any step backs. They they've made steps forward from a cup winning team. I mean, you can't. Most teams can't say that going into the next season. Who who is uh who is saying that uh, we're gonna miss Maroon more than? We think. Oh, it, come on! You've you've seen the the I, cesspool of Twitter. I I mean I've seen I've seen the 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 fanboys and girls uh you know crying about That's Maroon what leaving. I'm talking but, about okay yeah <laughs> yeah so so okay yeah uh, I, say, no, I could start uh, naming accounts if you want but I don't want yes to start let's write them down that. and call them out <laughs> and I'm sure they would love that yeah yes. I I was I was surprised at at how many people really felt that maroon was that big of an impact i mean the guy was really like bill an afterthought if he until doesn't March. score against dallas we might not even make it to the conference finals <laughs> biggest goal in blues history i, I, I mean it I might mean, be I, I, yeah I, I honestly believe that is the yeah. biggest goal in blues history right yeah. and i, I and, and, that's, and, and it was all thankful. robert Thomas. <laughs> and it really was but i mean he um yeah, and I mean, to be fair, I mean, we, we to be fair, uh, maybe we win the game anyway. We dominated that game. Yeah. And, uh, and Bishop was the only reason they were in that game. Yeah. Hey, so, let's let's not take anything away from it, though. That was... No, oh no, my it, gosh. no, no. I, it's, I, it's, I it, is, it is the moment that yes. every, every athlete in their particular sport dreams of. The double overtime game-winning goal in... A playoff game, you know. The only oh. thing that would have been better is if that is the goal that won the cup. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. I I, I don't think I've St. celebrated Louis, a goal. Yeah, that would have been unbelievable. I don't think I've celebrated a goal. I can't. Maybe the one against the Hawks in 2016. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, I I that goal I celebrated hard. Yeah. I mean, I just I mean, I'm just in my basement. Just the last around time. The last time I remember celebrating like that. Um, you know, not not holding the the Stanley Cup Final Game Seven in there because that was ridiculous. I probably celebrated for about three weeks straight. Um, I uh, uh, the the last time I remember celebrating that hard was in 2001 when I was at the game, Game Four. Chris Pronger scored in the third period against the Stars to put him up. I think it was three to one, and it was kind of like a foregone conclusion. Oh my God, they're actually going to sweep Dallas, and I lost my mind. I was 16 years old, and and that was the Biggest goal of my life. I, I loved it. I lost it. But, man, I haven't celebrated like that. And then all of a sudden, Pat Maroon scores, and I lost my mind. He's a hometown hero, baby. <laughs> it makes me cringe. But, I, okay, yeah. I let it, it's, a, it's a pass. We won the cup. Right. Um, right. So, <laughs> so, yeah, so the Maroon era is over. All right. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's, it was awesome. It was, it was uh, what you would want. One incredible year. The, I mean, the, the regular the, season was mostly forgettable. The, the, yeah, well, he, he the first seventy games he was almost invisible. Yeah, the last eleven games he kicked it up, put some pucks in the net, which was great. And uh, and I think he played well in the playoffs, but he didn't get didn't he had a few goals, but uh, I mean that was I I'm totally and like. Jeff, uh, Jeff said, "I totally appreciate what he did. I mean, uh, if, I, I can't absolutely. thank him enough Not for degrading him at all, giving us those memories. Right. right, exactly. I'm fantastic. But to say that he's a big loss on this no. team this year, no. no, 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 no. I mean, let's let's put things into perspective and step back and look at his body of work with the Blues was not very impressive last year. Yeah. Um. Anyway, with Falk, um, Carol, <laughs> which we just got sidetracked. Oh yeah, uh, that happened. <laughs> Carolina retains a little over fourteen percent of uh, Falk's salary for the season, so the Blues can remain cap compliant with a little bit of room, um, which I think was lost on most of social media and myself personally at first yeah. because I'm like, we signed Falk. I'm like, we got Falk. I'm like, well, how we the hell are we gonna? Yeah, yeah we we're way over the cap now. The gap. 
But but uh, no, okay, they retain salary, so that's cool. And, and the extension doesn't kick in until after the season. Right. He's on the last year of his current contract, which is $4 million something. Yeah. Four point. Actually, Allen's making more than he is this year. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Four, Allen's making 4.3, and the Fox bench. making 4.1 something, I think. Uh, um, it you know it, it, it's it's funny because he, you know these uh, these people that, <laughs> yeah we'll get into that for sure um, no it, it's funny because when that trade went down it was you know the first thought in my head was how much did Doug Armstrong preach this summer that he wants to make sure he's a little bit under the cap so he can make have room to make a, make a change if he has to mid season but I really feel like this trade. Came into hit not I don't want to say came into his lap. Obviously, he he worked through it. And they they found a solution, both teams that they were happy with. But like that happened, and I think he was like, "Well, shit, I have to make this trade." Like I, I know I want cap room, but I don't need it. I've got, like you said, Kurt, three All Star caliber, right handed shooting defensemen, and a guy who's gonna instantly step in and help our power play. Uh, f- uh, yeah, has a fantastic shot. Three-time All Star, um, one of the better goal scoring defensemen out there over the past five years. Falk ranks seventh among defensemen in goals and fourth in power play goals. Um, like we talked about, a weakness in the in the power play in the playoffs was obvious. Um, so um, they have, which we talked about, one of the best defenses, top to bottom in the NHL right now, maybe the best. Um, and like I said. 60 goals, I mean, from your defense, yeah, that, that's that's possible. Yeah. I mean, can Dunn score 15? Sure. What do you have, like 12 last year? Uh, Petrangelo can, I mean, he had a nice offensive year last right. year. If right. he duplicates he can, that, he 15. can put up 12 to 15. Yeah. Pareko, um, Pareko, if, he, you know, Pareko, if he hits the net, Pareko has had what 10 last yeah. year or something like that. So he, he, uh, he, uh, he's bound to break out goal wise eventually. Yeah, I think and, maybe this might be his year. And bringing in a guy like Falk, who knows, you know, who's been around a little bit longer and has had more success shooting the puck. You know, I know that they're, they're completely different statures, body styles. You know, their games are different, but you'd have to think that Falk can. I mean, Falk was an assistant captain in Carolina. He's he was a leader there, so he can come in and he can help Pareko and the younger guys learn a few things, you know, and, and I think that that could be something that you don't, don't even realize, you know, that he's coming in and I mean, the guy, the trade happened yesterday and the guy showed up at the game last night. I mean, that, that, yeah, that's pretty cool. And and it's cool too, that he had a, he had a, he got to pick where he wanted to go. Yeah. So when it was on the table with the, you know, the blues were a team, Granted, the extension played into the uh, okay. You're going to be seven years, okay. I'll, I'll go there, but he still wanted to come here. So that's so there's that's that's a that's a nice thing too. It's nice to have players that want to come here if they have a no trade, limited no trade, and this is one of the teams that he agreed to. So that's and that you know, that's what's funny. And I that was something I mentioned on Twitter that I know got some love because you you look back at 14 months ago and you know John Tavares didn't want to come here. Um, there was somebody else that I can't remember who it was, but but the, the the thought in St. Louis was, oh shit, we'll never be able to get a big name free agent again. We'll never be able to get anybody important. We're gonna get the Bozaks and the Perons, woohoo! Which uh, that wasn't me saying that. I was happy that they wanted to come here. But you know, then like like I said earlier uh, on Twitter, Carl Gunnarsson took a huge discount to come here. He wanted to stay, mm. which yep. is awesome. <clears throat> and then Justin uh, Falk, like you said. He obviously wanted to come. He was here last night for the game. I mean, yeah. he wants to be here. So we are a hockey destination now, folks, and that is really cool right. to see. Again, just 14 months after the narrative was nobody wants to come here. Right. And, yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to give away too much from, you know, for our what I assume will be our season preview show next week. But, you know, doing some reading um, in The Athletic over the last couple of days, you know, uh, a couple of points stood out to me. Um, today they released their uh, their player rankings. It was either The Athletic or ESPN, their, their, their player rankings. And top 50, there was one blue in the top 50. The Stanley Cup champion team was only it? had one O'Reilly? player. No, Tarasenko, number 32. O'Reilly not mentioned. And... Hmm. 
And Selkie that, winner but, too. But, but that's playoff MVP, huh? But that speaks to what a team this the is, depth, right? Yeah. The the yeah, depth of the agree, team. Yeah. It's it's yeah. it's you know, it Tarasenko's the name that stands out. Petrangelo could easily be on that list. I, you know, I, I they, they still had Drew Doughty in there, and I mean, God, that well, LA's been awful. I, I know he's he's still an elite talent, but come on, his salary yeah. dictates that he made that list. But, but anyway, <laughs> I, I guess my point is, Falk wanting to come to a team that isn't you know that isn't dominated by you know i i think i i have to think that he looked at that team that they had there and said you know what st louis this this team was great but it was super young and we're not going to win i want to go to a team like this and st louis looks like that right they they are a team that came together and you know i i i have to think that has something to do with his decision making well and then the beauty, too, is, you know, you think about how he was probably, I mean, I, I don't have his exact numbers in front of me, but I want to say he was pushing 30 minutes a night in Carolina. He probably looks at this and says, yeah, maybe down the road I'll have to do that again. But this upcoming season, um, that's going to take pressure off Petrangelo and Pareko down the stretch. It's going to take pressure off him for what he had to do for Carolina last year. These three guys are going to be able to split time a little bit more evenly, so you're going to be able to get more production out of these guys as the season progresses and as the playoffs start. I mean, that's that's you can't even quantify that. I mean, that's that's very important to have three guys on your blue line that you can literally put out there almost against anybody and and trust them to do the right thing. Uh, Falk was uh, 22, 22, 25 uh, average time on ice uh, yeah. last season. I, I was think way Jake, off. Jacob uh, Slavin was their uh, time on ice leader, I think. Defensive guy. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, okay. he's he's actually been about 22, 22, 23, 24, 24 over his career. So he's 22 to 24 a night-ish. So, but still, I mean, that's still I mean, solid. That, still right. solid. Yeah, it's, that's a lot of minutes. Right. So. And, and you know, the I guess everybody's big question is, what does this mean for Petrangelo, who's, you know, going to be UFA after the season? Yeah, and, and who knows? But um, because a lot can happen between now and then. Right. Yeah. And a ton of money, per- right. Players' performance this season can dictate a lot of stuff. Right. A ton um, of money coming off the books. Just 14 plus million come off the books. That includes Petrangelo's money. Um, so after that comes off the books, do you add him back in for eight, ten. nine? Well, uh, it, if and he that's wants the, ten, that's, I've just, that's no the thing. And and I think I think that is kind of how what this what Fox extension sets up says we're not going to give Petrangelo. We can't tie up a third of our cap in three defensemen. Right. I, I I hear you. And Wyshynski said this on he was in he was in St. Louis uh, and he was on uh, ESPN 101. I had him on the radio yesterday, and he brought up a conspiracy theorist point. And it was also mentioned on Twitter by a couple of uh, a Blues account uh, Blues fan accounts uh, that uh, this is a possibility. And it was interesting that Wyshynski said it too. So I was like, um, that the Blues will not they they have they have the opportunity or the option to not protect Falk right. during the expansion draft. Yeah. So after and, two seasons, right. they have the they have the, if they want out of his contract and they want to not protect him, they can put him out there. Right. And, and he would be the captain in Seattle. Yeah, if they want to pay him. Right. For I mean five more years. Who else is out six, there. For six more years on his right. on his contract. Yeah. So I mean that that's well, you gotta think that that it that at that point too you look at like what uh Vegas did with um was it Minnesota? That they said, hey, you know what? Don't take Matt Dumba. We'll give you this, this, and this. Maybe that's a move right. the Blues make. Maybe they say, okay, you know, don't take. We, we have to leave. Uh, just I can't. The player off the net, top of my head is Pareko, unprotected. Don't take him. We'll give you Falk. In it also, we'll give you David Perron. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know, but I'm just saying that that, that 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 makes it a potential too. That's why we have Perron though, too. That's right. The expansion draft. Right. <laughs> yep. That's why he's on the team. Uh-huh. <laughs> Guaranteed to be unprotected. Yeah, I don't know. I, uh, but okay, so uh, we we gave up Bach, uh, our the German prospect, right. um, s- uh, second, third uh, uh, highest uh, prospect in the organization. He was second, and I, so a couple of thoughts on this. So 
Clem Costin, the preseason that that guy's having, Doug Armstrong said, yeah, he's now he is now our number two prospect, and this you know Bach, not I don't think Bach was ever untouchable, but it just makes it that much easier to say, yeah, we can we can you know say goodbye to him. Um, it, it, yeah. well, well, I've heard though. I've heard that he could be like a top 10 in the NHL talent. Yeah. I heard that too. How? I heard that. I heard I'm, he's a lot I'm, like Leon Dreisaitl. Yeah. I mean, I they're both from Germany, uh, so they got to be the same, right? And the fact that yeah. they're German and could play in the NHL. <laughs> right. So right. obviously they're the same I, talent. I'm sorry. I don't have 168 free hours to watch <laughs> video of any prospect, well, let alone Eric Foley or Dominic Bach. Well, here's the thing with Bach. I, Bach, you know, uh, he's highly regarded right. as far as prospects goes in the organization. Um, but the thing with Bach is that you look at his numbers, oh, gosh, he put up more than a point a game or point and a half a game. And uh, But if you look at well, the team he played on, he was playing in uh, on a junior team yeah. in, in, in Sweden. A tier, a, a second, second tier team. Germany. Right? It was, it was a right. junior team. Yeah, but then and then he went, and so he and then he was drafted uh, to the WHL uh, to play for uh, the same team that Dreisaitl went to play for, uh, which was a men's a high a high end uh, under the NHL league, a league you go to. It's a path I believe it was players... a team called the Stanley Ponder Cup. I think that's it what might, it was. It might be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the team so, that players, uh, the league that players can go through as a road to the, to the NHL. And he turned it down to play in juniors over in Sweden and yeah. he racked up a ton of points. And then later on that season, like, the guys like, you, you're doing too well in this league. We got to put you to play with men. So he played, then they moved him to Vaxio. Uh, yeah. Uh, in the Swedish Hockey League. Yeah. And he didn't do near as well. Right. But and, it, and, and, he is now on loan from that team to another team. Right. And he's, uh, last I looked, he has no points in four or five games a season. So, yeah, it's but, early. Uh, no, no, it, it's early. And he's young. He's like eight. He, he was, yeah. he joined the, the, the junior team when he was 18. Uh, uh, and he, now he's 19. And he's, so he's very young. And he can go either which he can way. Easily, he could easily be a, a guy that's going to put up a lot of points in the NHL. But I sure. think the thing to really focus on, on here is the fact that he was honestly expendable. You know, you look at what the Blues have as prospects. We keep hearing about the big three. Obviously, Robert Thomas, maybe you don't consider him a prospect anymore. He's, he's an actual everyday NHL player. But Costin it looks, is looking good. Kairou's still a guy that they're talking about. This team's deep. I mean, it's it's so much fun to to look at how there's still players going to be coming up the pipe. Mackenzie McKecker, I mean, he's not going to be a elite guy, but he's a, a, a fine guy to plug in on your third or fourth line. I mean, there's plenty of guys like that on the Blues roster right. where it made Dominic Bach very expendable. Right. I mean, they gave a long look to Pagansky. You know, yep. I don't think there's any chance in hell he makes the opening night roster. Um, I think, you know, Costin's door might have opened up a little bit more, uh, depending on what uh, what Barbashev's status is after uh, getting smoked by Polak last night. Has, has anybody said how he's doing? I haven't heard. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to look for it today. Okay. Did you hear, Ponder? No, I, I heard he just opened the door. Yeah, and, and that's <laughs> the door never, you don't open. Never open that door. <laughs> right. Never yeah, open. Right. Everybody well, knows open that. that door. Was it the Roman no. Polak door? It was. It might have been. <laughs> so, hey, real so, yeah. quick, we got a couple comments that I wanted to read here from uh, our our listeners. First of all, light, sound, geometry. What do we call this guy? Scuba. LSG. Call LSG. Scuba, right? Yeah, you you call them uh, scuba. Yeah. Scuba. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, just yeah. to be stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, he asked, is uh, Falk a smooth skater? Uh, very easy answer to that. Yes, you will. Uh, I think the best comparison I've seen in his skating and puck moving ability is Kevin Shattenkirk. I just think he's better defensively. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. And I think still, I, I think if you're going to knock on Falk, it's still his defensive zone play. That's, if you're going to knock on him. Uh, which, But it is better than no, Shattenkirk, yes, for yes, sure. Yes, it is better than Shattenkirk. <laughs> Um, but if you if you say okay, well, what's his weakness? Well, he's not as good in his defensive zone. So, but pull up some uh, some YouTube clips when you get time. Obviously, after this show, because you need to have full attention on Let's Go Blues Radio. But once we're right. done, 
and you might accidentally clips. minimize that YouTube clip and <laughs> hear stuff yeah. you don't want to hear. Yeah, no, I, I'll own that, man. I I, uh, I totally botched the first oh, five, that is eight, so eight funny. minutes of the episode, and so yeah, just fast forward. Can I until... can I just admit, Kurt, that I love the fact that that was your fault. It that was... just makes this so much better. And what's <laughs> what's funny is that it I uh I don't think it went out to everybody. Did it? To uh, I think it did. YouTube did it? Could you hear it? Yeah. You, you can hear that. Okay. I I had mine paused, but I'm I'm pretty sure. Like I started commenting. Like, can people hear us? And everybody's like, Yeah. Like you're live. Didn't somebody say there was no echo? <laughs> there was no they echo. Said there was no that? echo. Yeah, but but I think they, was, no, they didn't hear that. Line, they no. heard us. Yeah, you guys heard. Uh, it. Yeah, we could hear it looping because yeah. it was on your soundboard. Yeah, but I thought the same. I couldn't hear it. Uh, but I thought my audio was pumped into the show, but I guess I don't know. It's this is a new setup. Give me a break. Shut up. Mm, yeah. Leave me alone. This, <laughs> this is, <laughs> uh so a couple more comments from our listeners uh Jay Hughes. Uh he says uh Barbershev is day to day, so we'll see how uh, hopefully he's correct. Uh um, we, we all? also have the Falk yeah, right. I know I am. Jesus. I can't get away from my plantar fasciitis issues. When Kurt when Bert, Kurt and I were testing earlier, I was sitting there wrapping my foot because I had a hockey game two hours later, and I'm trying to wrap it with KT tape, feeling like an old man because I can't even put on skates without being in pain. Um, but uh, we got, uh, let's see, uh, Lachlan ruined it, the guy who uh, said thanked Kurt and Bill for the show earlier. Uh, this is my first live show. I only listen to Apple Podcasts, and I love the replica Stanley Cup, which uh, we both have one, but I will say that uh, Kurt's is much better. Mine's You're... handmade. Let me move my head. There we go. For those yeah. watching, it's right behind my Very nice. stage right, right shoulder. It's a nice little cup. It's just uh, it's not shiny. It's, it's handmade. It's, uh, I got it off Etsy. Uh, but, yeah, Kurt's is much nicer. Uh, and then uh, uh, Scuba Ads, which, you know, this guy was on the team – Joel Edmondson, how long? And he calls him Jed. I had <laughs> never heard him called Jed before. I didn't know he was talking about it first. I'm like, who's Jed? <laughs> I love it. I love that nickname. Jed Clampett. Okay. Uh, Jed barely had offense, it seemed, and now you add Fox 40 points. It's crazy. You know what, though? Yeah, you know what? I, I, uh, Edmondson didn't uh, put up many points, but I always felt like he was better offensively than his stats showed. I agree. I, I always thought he stepped he was good in at keeping nicely. the puck on the blue line. Yeah, I thought he stepped in nice. I thought he pinched uh, at good. I thought it was a uh, good instincts in the offensive zone. I just don't think he got many points out of it. Yeah, I, I remember uh, many conversations of of usually started by Bill because he was angry about Petrangelo playing on the power play, oh, and I remember man. us saying like, "Give Joel Edmondson a shot. He's good at keeping the puck in. He's got a good shot, and he's good. At, he's a good passer once he's in the zone." So. No, I, I like Edmondson, and I'm, you know, part of the Stanley Cup winning team, always going to be in Blues lore, so good luck to him in Carolina. But, uh, man, I, I love this trade. I can't not oh, love yeah. it. it. It's a it's a, it's a a win-win. It's a big win for us short term. Uh, say in five years, uh, if Bach pans out for Carolina, maybe they're, look, they're feeling good about it. Yeah. Um, and if Edmondson yeah. plays well, you know, and they resign him. And Carolina know. is so deep. Like they're they are like number two offensive depth wise to the Rangers, I think, prospects wise. So adding Bach to that he's buried. You know, yeah, yeah. Well he's buried, but if he's, he he's if like, he pans out, it's you know it's he's just, like three years away at right? least. Yeah. So I mean, but he's got. They know they need that though to to compete in that division, right? And, and, it's a trade. and I it's think a, that if he if he pans out, I think it works out for both teams. I mean, they get exactly what they want. It's a trade chip too. If he if yeah. he's if a good prospect, they can always trade him. Yeah. And last thought on Edmondson, at least for me, is uh, you know, a, how many players go through arbitration and aren't with the team a year later? I mean, it, it's I forget. It's, when not, they, not even a month later, a month later. Right, they were going through uh, when arbitration season was around the you know the doldrums of hockey news. Um, I forget uh, who put that out there, but it was, it was something like eighty plus percent of players who go through arbitration wind up not with the team and within uh, and this eighteen months. And this Edmondson, uh, the contract. We, I mean, I think we all agreed at the time that it was oh, too much. They gave him too much. Yeah. 
Yeah, and they so, did. That's yeah. a nice. That's a nice. I mean, uh, getting the getting a, a good deal aside, um, the fact that we got rid of the contract it was probably a little high. Uh, you know, there's that too. So yeah, I agree. Probably about a million no, too high. I, it, and again, I mean, uh, you know, Joel Edmondson. I think his I think his ceiling is much higher than what he showed us last season. But I mean, when you look at you talk about players' ceilings, Justin Falk is way higher than that. So oh, if God. you just want to compare the defensive pro, the defensive return and the the one we gave, I mean, Blues win 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 on that one. I think uh, unless we see injury, but you can't you can't prepare well, for that. You never no. that you know. And with Falk coming to a better team, uh, a deeper defensive team, um, it makes you wonder if he will have his a really good offensive year. Just, I mean, I, will. He, I mean, he's he's gonna have he's gonna have should have more freedom to, you know, playing against you know he's not gonna be playing against the top line. What was he? What was he? Was he top pair in Carolina? I think he was. I think he was like a Shattenkirk there. I think he was used in the second pair. Okay. Yeah. Because they like you, like uh, Bill said, Jacob Slavin was was used on the top pair mostly. Mm, okay. Um, it was, I think Slavin yeah, and, and Hamilton were top pair last year. Yeah, that's right, Dougie Hamilton. Yeah, you're right. Mm. Um, you know, and, and you know, the other thing to add to this, like you said, Kurt, with uh, with him having a good offensive year, the, and I, that that take away from the way Rod Brindamore coaches. I think people in Carolina love him, and he coaches a very fun style, but. Craig Berube, I think, coaches a style that, that really benefits the defenseman. And I think that maybe that's part of the big reason they wanted it, was they said, okay, we got Berube locked up now for a couple of years. He coaches a style where these these forwards just go in and forecheck, feed the puck back to the point. We need a guy who can get shots through. And there's very few defensemen in the league that are better at that than Justin Falk. It's going to be interesting to see how – Savard is going to impact the the power play once the season starts, and and uh, how effective it is, and if they have a different mindset with the power play. Yeah, because it was frustrating last year at times. Like I said, even though they were tenth in the league, I saw that stat and I'm like, really, they were tenth in the regular season? Yeah, I don't remember. I mean, I I know they got a lot of points from the defensemen, and well, but, I mean, they the power play really got going during the streak, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and that was yeah. that yeah. they. They catapulted ahead of a lot of teams that stagnated, and you know, so it, it was a perfect storm. I remember a lot right, of teams were struggling. Right. And the Blues blew by them. Yeah, yeah nobody I, else was. I remember you, was, Kurt, making. I remember Kurt. you making the comment, Kurt, that Anaheim had lost like ninety-two games in a row. <laughs> <laughs> they did, man. They lost. A, that was hilarious. I was. That just, was I'm, the worst. I'm rooting for them to lose every night. I'm like, yeah, let's keep this going. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. Uh, no, so we'll we'll add a couple more here from a couple people here. Uh, uh, Scuba, L-S-G-A-E, adds, it's a good time to be a Blues fan. We are a deep club, which kind of what we alluded to earlier. Uh, he also says, I didn't like the Bach pick. Blues are deep down the middle for a five-year window. And, you know, that's actually a, a good point. I think maybe, you know, and I know that a lot of times, you know, uh, like Bill Armstrong, who I think does a great job uh, heading the, the scouting for the Blues, um, I think a lot of times, you know, they, they might tell the GM, hey, this Dominic Bach guy, he's great. And then, you know, Doug Armstrong might look at the depth chart and say, well, we got this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy's under contract. This guy's going to be under contract. We're working on locking him up. We don't need a center, you know. And then you say, well, that's, you know, that's a good trade ship, you know, something to have in the pipeline. You might be able to move in, in a year or two. And, and again, I don't know if that's how the conversation went for Bach, but – Maybe that's part of it, you know, that they said, hey, we got this kid who has great offensive skill. And, yeah, maybe he comes up with the club. He's a pretty old all-star for the Blues. But, hey, if he doesn't, let's trade him before we start realizing that's not what he is. And that could have easily been what they did here. Um, as we talked about Costin, um, uh, we, I guess we'll have a show next week to discuss the uh, the season, kind of like a, a mini preview show. We've done a little bit here today, but we can do some more next week. Yeah, uh, we're a week away from the season. I know. A week tonight. away. How about tonight? that? A Raising a banner. Yeah. Short mm-hmm. off season. Uh, yeah, a week away from uh, season opener. Raising a banner. Initial hockey again. It does not seem like we've been off that long. Um, we haven't. 
Yeah. So. Th- that well, is... I haven't. <laughs> 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 yeah. Ponder's been the workhorse this this yeah. summer That's as true. every summer. That's true. So, um, yeah. Thank you for uh, keeping the keeping the torch lit and moving. No, um, it's uh, it's fun. But no, you know what's what's cool about it is, you know, you guys said it, it doesn't. Smoke. We've been off that long. It's so weird thinking that we're getting ready to start the next season, right? Like you guys still feel that, right? Like it's like, yeah. Wait a minute, we just saw them skate around Boston with the Stanley Cup. Feels like yesterday. And now we're talking about them raising a banner and starting their their cup defense. And we it's all crazy. have to sit down and watch the damn series again. I mean, you have to. Oh, I know. Yeah. It's, yeah. You get it. Get it injected into your veins one more time. Get the get the watch the DVD or watch the streaming uh, the the documentary about the Blues that they put out. Yep. Um, and uh, Fox uh, Sports is rebroadcasting the this weekend. 29th and thirtieth, I think it is. There, yep. it's two nights. All the the wins in the uh, Boston series. Yep, and so, listen to Let's Go Blues Radio behind enemy lines. Do all that too. Yes, do that too. Um, <laughs> you all thirty episodes. Yeah, in it, two days. How many more you got? Because there was a bad <laughs> echo in the beginning when you were talking about it. How many more? Uh, there's two left. Um, we've got uh, Columbus that I'm going to release on Saturday. We're originally supposed to get posted tomorrow, but with us doing this show, I'm going to wait. And then uh, next week we've got the last one, which is the Winnipeg Jets, which. Uh, was a lot of fun to talk about. We obviously talked about the 2019 series a lot. Um, and while we're kind of on the the behind enemy lines, I, I'm going to kind of pan my camera up a little bit, or I guess myself, and thank the wild and free that that shirt, everybody. Uh, the band that you hear at the beginning of every episode. Why are your arms like, up oh, in the I'm air? Not, I'm not. I'm not. I'm, here we go. Here we go. I kind of feel like I'm like poaching out my stomach. Like, oh, let me I'm this pregnant. Is- this is but, yeah. painful to watch. It's it's cringe worthy. Really. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, there we go. How about that? Splice our intro That's over this. It, yeah, so That's all you need everybody. For our uh, podca- no, so, uh, for our podcast again, listeners, it's a is a black shirt, white letter says uh, live wild live wild and free. Live wild uh feel free. Live wild feel Be free. Be wild and free. Yes. And yeah, it's it's uh, so it's a cool t-shirt that they sent me. Um Appreciate it, guys, and uh, they do a great job. Love their music. Uh, I think they got an album coming out here soon. They are uh, they they play in St. Louis all the time. So if you like what you hear at the start of every Behind Enemy Lines episode, make sure you check them out. Um, love their love their stuff. I think they have a, a very cool sound. And uh, I will be honest that I am a curmudgeon when it comes to young people music. I have gotten to that age. So when I find a, a band that's there that's young like them, I think they're like nineteen or twenty. It's uh, it's rare that I'm like, oh yeah, that actually sounds pretty good. So thank you, Wild and Free. Um, I think that's gonna wrap up our show. Shortest show ever. Uh, yeah, you know, hour and hour. Well, we got uh, hour twenty, hour fifteen. So we got we got one question. We got asked by Jay Hughes, uh, how much do you think Braden will sign for if he's wanting six million plus? What do you think we can get for him? I think that, you know what, let's just say, uh, let's I, do a little teaser here. That's going to be a conversation next week. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, and I was going to say something, I, but as far, I, I, you want me to, just, I'll wait till next week. Yeah. But I, I have something well, I to Bob, say about it. So. Bob kind of said my thoughts. He says, depends, depends on, on where, they're, where they're at by the trade deadline. Well, and yeah, if, that's and if, kind of. If we're having a good season, we don't move him at all. Yeah. I mean, if he's playing right. well, yeah. no. You take right. the risk of losing. Yeah, no. And you and I'm sorry, but if you're if you're near the top of the league and you have cup hopes and and he's playing well, you you ride him into the ground and you run the risk of losing him for nothing. I I'm sorry, I, that's just you don't ditch a, I, a piece I, like that. Watching the the Blues finally do it last season, accompanied with what Columbus did against Tampa, and I know they only went to the second round, but you know I was like. They're going to acquire more guys. They're just going to lose in the offseason. Like, what the hell? But seeing them go for it, it, it and say, okay, these this is like acquiring rentals. We got guys that we know are going to be gone, but we're going to go for the cup. And, and again, accompany that with what we saw the Blues do. My mindset on that has completely changed. So I say, yeah, if, if Braden Shen, I don't care if he leaves next season. If you've got a chance to win another cup, ride it out. And just, yeah, hey, we're going to keep you. You might go somewhere else over the summer. So let's go get another cup there, buddy. Uh, 
thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, thanks to Adam Scorgy. Thanks, thanks to Adam uh, Scorgy for Scorgy uh, for. Uh, I totally screwed that up. <laughs> for coming on and uh, yeah, check out the uh, Making Coco, the Grand Fear story, next week in St. Louis, October 1st at Ballpark Village and uh, Friday, October 4th uh, at Marcus Theaters in St. Louis. I don't know if all of them are showing it. I think, s- if, is there more than six? I think it's select theaters. Six yeah, of them. I, I think yeah, it's like, I, I think I think it's like six of them. Uh, Creve Core or uh, Chesterfield. O'Fallon is. O'Fallon, O'Fallon, Illinois. Is. Illinois, yeah. And so why are we going over to Ponders for this? I don't know. I, Ronnie's yeah. is, uh, uh, you know what? I've I've been to Ronnie's a few times, and it's a it's like their centerpiece theater. So yeah, I've, I've you know, yeah. I, I said it's better because it's in Missouri. <clears throat> uh, Something like that. Uh, you guys got red clay dirt over there. What are you talking about? Yeah. Hey, anyway. I I will <sighs> say I'm uh, I'm what two minutes from Illinois now. It's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, if if anybody wants to come out and join us for the uh the nine thirty showing at Ronnie's next week, Ponder will sign your uh popcorn uh empty popcorn <laughs> container after right. the show. I will. Right. Mm. I will have a Sharpie ready for you. Can you hear this, Jeff? No. Hmm. Weird. Okay. Then I won't play it because it's probably not going out. Yeah. Just post Post yeah. uh, post show edit. Yeah, post yeah. show edit. Yeah, YouTube will have no. And then, okay, music. so then ask. Go ahead and ask that question again for the post show edit. Uh, ask, can ask, you ask Jeff? Can you hear this? Can you hear this, Jeff? Yeah, that was hilarious. <laughs> it's, it's you're Jim so Carr. funny, Kurt. It's the normal outro. It's the normal outro. God. Yeah, it's just the. Anyway, oh, so uh, it's not funny then. That's thank, great. Uh, that funny, that will for Jeff Hunter and Bill Damker. That will conclude this week's broadcast of Let's Go Blues Radio, your favorite St. Louis Blues hockey podcast. Until next time, everyone, let's go Blues. Let's go Blues.